Hello? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just a quick housekeeping from me before I hand over to uh, Dame Mary Archer. Um, obviously, the vagarities of signal and um, internet, if you could bear with us if there are any um, slight hiccups. Um, and after the Minister has spoken, he will be taking question and answers. Please, can you use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll be um, asking questions at the end. I'll now hand over to Dame Mary Archer. Thank you very much, uh, Judy, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Mary Archer, I'm Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Science Museum Group, and the National Railway Museum is a great jewel in our Northern Crown. So I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar, which is one of a series being run by the NRM development team. Um, and I should say the uh, whole thing will be recorded um, so that those who couldn't join us um, uh, live, as it were, today will be able to uh, view the proceedings. Today, we're very privileged to have with us Chris Heaton Harris, who's MP for Daventry and Minister of State at the Department for Transport with uh, responsibility for inter alia rail. He's going to talk to us in a moment. And then, uh, as Julie has said, uh, Judith McNichol, who's the director of the NRM, will facilitate questions from the floor. Chris was appointed to the Department for Transport a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, I think. Before that, he was a parliamentary undersecretary at DEXU. Before that, he was a government chief whip. And before that, he was an MEP. His theme today is powering up the North, which couldn't be more timely as just today, Grant Shapps, the Secretary of State, has announced a 589 million investment uh, fund to upgrade railways and stations across the North. Chris, it's lovely to have you with us and may I now invite you to speak to us. Dame Mary, thank you very much in, in, indeed and thank you for the invitation um to speak to this webinar and in, indeed it is a great day for the north of england because yet uh, the secretary of state grant chaps has been um in manchester to announce a 589 million pound investment to kickstart all the rail upgrades across the north with um well actually it adds up to more than 600 million worth of investment in northern in the northern rail uh, uh, network in, in the coming months and indeed a new panel, a new um, council led by Grant Shapps, who is the Northern Powerhouse Minister, to give Northern leaders a direct line into government um, to try and accelerate some of these projects, uh, something our Prime Minister is very, very keen on. Um, and thank you for inviting me to 
this webinar. I, I, I'm now becoming slightly used to this form of communication, um, but still hating every second of them. Um, I'd much rather be with people, seeing people and interacting with people. And, um, and I've had tons of technology issues today, so I'm so glad this one has kind of worked so far. Um, but I just wanted to talk to you about our investment and actually also um, a tiny bit about uh, reinvesting in railways where they might have been closed um, previously. As you know, the government is, um, and if you've read anything I've ever said whilst being rail minister, you'd have heard me bang on that this government is investing record uh, levels of rail funding um, into the biggest rail modernization program for over a century. We're spending over 48 uh, well, actually, just under 47.9 billion pounds over in the industry, what's called control period six, which runs from 2019 to 2024. And that's to improve rail services for passengers uh, and uh, freight customers whilst maintaining the very, very high levels of safety and reliability we have in our system. And um, the bit that seems to have caught people's eye is the bit I'll talk about a tiny bit more in in this program because in the general election manifesto we we talked previously a tiny bit about restoring our railways but we pledged that we would we would do it in um, uh, my party's manifesto and um, we, we initially just pled, uh, pledged 500 million pounds to start reopening lines stations reconnecting communities regenerating local economies to try and improve access to jobs homes education for towns that have been cut off in the past and the excitement that seems to have generated across the country is amazing. Uh, there is not one moment when I'm in the House of Commons, if, if I'm heading to the chamber uh, to listen to a speech or to answer questions or whatever, if I'm going to the tea room by the chamber to get a cup of tea, um, I, that I'm not lobbied by MPs of every colour who have got bids in to the Restoring Our Railways fund who've been energized by the communities they represent even in these horrid times um, because they have got a fantastic idea as to how they can restore a local railway. I mean, the fund that we've got is actually split out into three ways. There's the ideas fund which is to accelerate the development of existing proposals and um, and we're trying to make yeah, so we, we're trying not to say no actually to too many people. We're trying to we try to change how the Department for Transport has worked in the past, which has always been uh, you know we've got our program and, and that's all we're sticking to, to a department that holds the hands of projects that might not be in the right place, um, and walks them through what well, is sometimes a very complicated procedure, which we're trying to simplify. So they can get to a point where we can invest some public money in them to get an idea uh, brought to the fore. We've also got a, 20 million, a new £20 million pound, uh, round of the new stations fund to benefit areas um, that could do with those. And we've got an, a, another fund which is to, um, we've agreed to give £5 million pounds to develop proposals to drive forward the return of passenger services on the Ashton Blythe Tyne line, for example, in Northumberland, um, in addition to £1.5 million that we'd already initially pledged. Um, so we're giving quite some quite chunky pieces of money away and we're giving quite small pieces of money away to try and bring some ideas to the fore. The, the ideas fund, I mean, it's, I, I really do think is exciting. Some of the ideas that have come forward, which are really, you know, they're an early stage of development. They need to explore more options involving a trans, for a transport problem. And they, the, the ideas have been inspired by the communities affected by the beaching cuts, but not limited to them. Um, and they're coming forward with ideas that could, um, yeah, affordable ways of providing a new passenger service. Um, and we want to really try and work with the, uh, these areas to try and see how we can help them. The fund's a kind of Kickstarter um, that provides local communities with the financial support to bring these ideas with our support with our guidance to a point where we're beginning to develop a full, a full business case. Um, we received 60 applications in the first round. Uh, it, it, was, it was really, really wonderful to see from across uh, uh, the country. And um, we received a similar number in the second round that just closed um, 
on the 19th of, uh, uh, of June. And it's uh, we're actually on that. Uh, the process then is we ha I have a panel of experts that sifts through all these studies. And even if we are not, uh, to only 10 um, move through the process in the, in, in the first iteration to, uh, to maybe receive some ideas funding money um, in the first place. However, we are working with the others to get them to that stage um, in, in the future. I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm hoping that I can be the minister that doesn't say no too many times um, to these, these, uh, these projects. And I believe, I really do believe that actually some of these projects are going to give us project, um, uh, projects that are much better value for money than existing rail projects, much higher BCRs, BFM figures, um, to actually challenge some of the ways that we spend um, money. So uh, the second round's uh, just closed. The panel um, to SIFT meets next week, and we hope to announce um, the outcomes for that at the end of the summer. And then we've got a third round plan for November, and already people are coming forward with even, even more ideas. Um, but I know that you know, the 500 million pounds that we've currently uh, got won't restore 5,000 uh, miles of track, uh, and the over 2,300 closures made under the beaching cuts but it is a firm commitment to kickstart um, promising schemes to bring new ideas to the table. And it shouldn't really be seen in isolation because we spend two billion pounds a year restoring our railways and this fund's kind of just opening the scope of that so we can look at some uh, more exciting projects. And maybe, maybe, uh, I know it's stimulated the excitement of the treasury and um, there's a spending review just coming up and I, I hope to be making quite a quite a big ask for um, this fund within that uh, review. And as we assess and develop these schemes, there is an ambition to really drive forward quickly because our plan really is, and I'll, I'll finish here so I can take some questions, uh, to level up local economies across the country to improve access to jobs, education, boosting um, uh, the areas of our country that have been cut off. And this really does affect and should benefit the north of England probably more than any other region because that's where so many cuts were made, where towns have been separated for such a long period of time and um, a huge number of the, of the potential plans come from there. So big sums of money coming to the north of England for rail announced today um, for, for the future and some very exciting projects being developed by local communities led by local MPs in the restoring um, your, rail, uh, your railways fund area as well. I think it's actually even though we've had a horrible time during the pandemic the railway has been actually quite fundamental to our being able to recover from it. The railway kept going all the way through it. Yes it's had huge sums of public money but we were delivering key workers across the nation to where they needed to go we were flexible we're unbelievably clean um, now you will never get on a cleaner railway than the than uh, our railways now and going forward we want to make sure that we are opening up all the possibilities that a railway brings across the nation That's great, thank you, Chris. So I'd like to um, invite people to ask questions um, from um, our audience. Um, I thought maybe we'd kick off, Chris, you're talking about the Ideas Fund and the 60 applications um, and, uh, and the Beaching Fund. And we just wondered um, what were the most standout? Was there anything in particular that you thought was really inspirational looking to the future? Because um, obviously the, the museum, we look at the history of rail, but one of the exciting things about Vision 2025 is looking at the future of rail. And I wondered where you saw that going. Yeah, so I, I, I shouldn't really, I can't really tell you that, Julia, because um, <laughs> I do sit on the panel that judges these things and I don't, I don't want to walk into it. So I, I don't get the paperwork until this weekend and I don't want to prejudge anything. But I, have been, I promise you, I've been lobbied by MPs who are unbelievably excited about... Um, now, what's a, what's a, uh, Paul Holmes, who's the new MP for Sedgefield, unbelievably excited and positive about reopening of Ferry Hill Station and maybe the Leamside line after that. You know, that really quite... Um, yeah, these are quite, I know these are quite historic railways, but actually if you look where, um, and government looks at, where can we get housing and economic growth? Um, 
and you look at the area that that's in and you think wow there's a huge amount of potential there um there's uh, down in the southwest there's uh, the route to oakhampton that um, could do with upgrading there, there's there's, play, uh, there's a fantastic project in wales that i've been lobbied um for but i i'm going to wait and see what the papers say and how they all stack up but as i say the, the good thing about this is we're not we're, we're trying not to say no to people even if the bid is not in a fit state really to move forward now instead of just saying no that's it um we're trying we're assigning officials um to help these uh, projects move forward to a point where we can really help them brilliant um So we've got a couple of questions that are coming in thick and fast now. So uh, Justin Moss from Siemens, are there any plans for a new operating model to provide more empowerment to the supply chain by procuring early contractor models, output specifications and self-assurance? Um, I, I suppose the, the, the easy answer to that would be yes, because it's a, a very good way of um, getting better value for money for the taxpayer, but it's way more complicated than a simple yes. Um, uh, now, I am the rail minister who has spent um, a huge amount of time now with uh, working with the supply chain and in fact trying to ensure that we have a very healthy supply chain because um, I was we were particularly worried about it uh, at the beginning of the, uh, of the pandemic and what we want to have a robust supply chain to deliver these big projects for us and give us choice so we can choose between people and companies and uh, and get good value for money for uh, projects and so we decided at the very beginning that network rail will be paying the supply chain on invoice the train operating companies have been doing pretty much the same thing to try and maintain the liquidity and uh, um, of, of our supply chain and now we want to try and um, yeah stimulate how we do things and um, stimulate the supply chain and do things in a slightly more efficient way and so what's being suggested there is kind of, yeah kind of the route we're looking at at the moment Brilliant. So the next question from Catherine at uh, DB Card Cargo. Chris, uh, freight has received no subsidy from Treasury during the COVID crisis, but obviously kept essential supplies moving throughout the UK. How do you see freight and modal shift being supported by government um, going forward? Yeah, so uh, freight. Um, so actually, freight, I, I, I missed it out from my speech, I suppose, which is very remiss of me. Um, I, I am the MP for the Dumtree International Rail Freight Terminal. I've, I've got some of the biggest um, modal shift stuff going on in, in the heart of my uh, constituency. And it's an amazingly impressive uh, place. But actually, um, freight did receive government funding. Um, we've done it in, in, in very different ways, whether it be through a furloughing scheme, whether it be through... Um, Oh, what's that? Uh, this we, we essentially pay, uh, uh, give a little money for each uh, container that is um, carried across our, our network, and that was we we've tried to make sure there's more uh, more money and more liquidity in this area. But equally, the freight companies are well, fairly feisty, independent organisations, and um, they whilst they looked at some of the treasury schemes, they you know, uh, really yet to get to the stage where they needed to access them. But I, um, yeah, freight has done an amazing job for this country throughout uh, this uh, uh, crisis. They've kept, uh, we've had food moving around, medicines moving around, all sorts of things moving around. I know there's been lulls because construction basically slowed down to um, uh, very, very sharply at the beginning, but construction is now picking back up. I know there was a lull because Chinese and other uh, goods from the East stopped coming um, because they were in lockdown at different periods of time. and. Uh, and you know, everything got out of kilter. But um, I think freight's shown its value probably more than ever before um, in, uh, in, well, certainly in modern times and has an unbelievably healthy future in our network. Brilliant, thanks, Chris. So next question we've got from Nina Harding. Um, does the Department for Transport have any plans to reform rail procurement and prioritise the UK supply chain in the upcoming spending review? So procurement is an interesting one because we are, um, we've imported all the uh, European rules, but we can actually change them, uh, the procurement rules as we, as we move forward. But um, we're actually pretty good at procuring um, uh, British uh, 
well, from British companies and British and British product. I think Network Rail, I think I think it's ninety eight percent of it still comes from is is made in the United Kingdom. So, um, I think we're in a fairly healthy space. But there is more we can do. Um, but I am aware that lots of the so tier one companies for um, for the big companies that do win some of the major contracts. Uh, you know, they're based in other countries, but they always subcontract down and use British businesses. So um, it's not as simple as just saying we're going to buy British. There are other ways of skinning this, uh, that particular cat. Uh, but there is more we can do, and I'm pretty keen to do it. Brilliant. And then there's one quest, well, it's a question, um, observation from Neil Robertson. Um, great work on securing the new investment. Anything we can do to help you with your spending review bid? <laughs> Yeah, I, I yes, write to the Chancellor and say how wonderful all these ideas, uh, rail is and what it can do. Brilliant. Any more questions for anybody? Do you think I'll get told off for lobbying for the Chancellor? <laughs> I mean, he should expect nothing else uh, from us, really. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, there was one more question that we'd had that somebody had sent in, so we'll use that one. Um, it was around the, um, obviously we're talking about the future of rail and, and looking, looking um, at how you see things developing. Um, and um, we're thinking about the crucial between the north-south divide, Chris, and how we think that um, the infrastructure, obviously announcement today is amazing, um, and, and what will be done to back that up. Yeah, well, I mean, we're now putting our money where our mouth is, and um, uh, and we're very keen. I mean, the, the reason the Prime Minister keeps on talking about build, 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 and acceleration, and there's a project speed that's based in Downing Street to, and uh, headed up by the Chancellor to drive things forward, is because we know there will be scepticism, because governments of all colours in the past have promised lots and not really delivered too much. So we want to move to delivery, the delivery phase of, the, uh, of lots of these um, big announcements very very quickly and um, I know that's what the spending review is going to be focusing on you know what what can actually be delivered so people can see the changes that they need now I, I want to see I'm very keen to see decarbonization across our rail network now you know, that leads us down a certain path which we've veered away from previously with a bit of um, but there are new technologies and electrification we are which we've been very good at we um, uh, I've seen us selling abroad to other countries um, and know that we can do it really well here. And so there's a, so there's a whole host of elements that I think we can bring, which are, as I keep reminding the Chancellor and the um, Chief Secretary of the Treasury, are shovel ready. You know, uh, we know what we're doing and um, we're pretty keen to uh, get on with the job. And that's why you're seeing some Big announcements which are to do accelerate these projects coming forward now. Brilliant. So we've got from Richard Shaw, what is the biggest challenge and opportunity from the identified investment today? Uh, today, well actually um, the biggest challenge is actually getting everybody to work together I guess because um, whilst the north is a, a geographic region there are competitive elements in it and there are lots of projects that, uh, that need it and you've got, to, you've got to invest in the whole of the, uh, of the north. And there's a second challenge to that actually which is for rail just at this current time which is to bring people back to it because um, in February we had our busiest ever month um, I believe on our railways and then in, by the end of March we were down to five percent of passenger numbers because people had taken notice of the government advice and were staying at home so um, we now need to help them come back to our railways so uh, we get the revenue in that allows us to pay for um, lots of these projects um, uh, going forward because rail fares do fund a huge amount of rail investment um, and then so that was the, the there were the challenges the opportunity where well, it's just connection because I you know you the infrastructure that we're talking about is going to will connect the north like it hasn't been connected in decades and um, you do not need to look too far afield in other countries when you see big vibrant cities similar to Leeds, Manchester. And I do include places like Hull and Newcastle and Liverpool and all this. You see if you connect them, the economic benefits you bring for the whole of the region and the country are just massive. 
Brilliant. And then we had a question from Mary. Um, wanted to know um, about, ask Chris to say something about the HS2, as the department now sees it and the extent of the build and the timetable. Well, it might, it might have been missed in the, um, in, because it was all in the COVID period, but actually lots of these projects have moved on whilst we've been um, in lockdown. So HS2 finally got notice to proceed um, in the midst of lockdown, which unlocks a whole host of funding and, uh, and planning um, elements. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a very, very big deal uh, for HS2. And that means, um, you know, you'll be looking at next spring at, at uh, starting the procurement for rolling stock and the build, you know, I, it's not too far away from me where they're building um, the first leg of HS2 and it's, it's moving on a pace. And so, um, yeah, the excitement is definitely there and the investment is definitely there. And the, I, I'm, there are still quite a few people who are cynical about the delivery of, of HS2. But uh, I would say, you know, the government's had plenty of opportunities if it really wanted to ditch it to ditch it. It hasn't. It's investing in it. It's being delivered and it will drive big changes on our rail. Uh, for me, um, in Northamptonshire, whilst we, uh, it, we have the controversy of it in the south without it stopping, in my patch, we have the uh, bonus of it freeing up a huge amount of capacity um, on the, on the lines that serve my constituents, um, which bring quicker journeys to London, more freight paths to uh, Daventry International Rail Freight Terminal and a whole host of other things. So um, lots and lots of news coming from HS2 in the course of the next nine months about um, development, delivery and procurement. And that actually ne ties neatly onto a second question from Justin Moss. Um, it's great that we are looking to at further support to the north. However, externally, the rail industry isn't seen as a secure option due to its boom and bust nature. What ideas have been presented to increase skills base to enable the delivery of northern powerhouse rail whilst HS2 and the associated control period are competing against it? Yeah, so I kind of disagree with the premise of the question, I'm afraid, because uh, I don't think we're viewed like that from outside. And certainly we have a very competitive um, market who want, to, uh, who want to work. I understand the, that, um, I think the point probably is more that we need a pipeline so people can plan um, to supply. And there is absolutely, uh, you know, we're building like, we're gonna be building like crazy and um, there are skill shortages already. So we do need to train um, huge numbers of people um, in what will be valuable jobs that will last a very long time. And um, yeah, so th there's massive investment in apprentices as, a, as most people on this call will know, um, but we are really working with the industry to try and drive investment in people as much as we are in investment in infrastructure because um, we will need that expertise. And better than that, we also sell that expertise overseas and it brings in extra added value to the country. I think there was just, just a supplementary comment from Justin was that he was referring to the challenges around the high speed raid college and the yeah, struggle that, that so they're it, against it, students. I, yeah, I mean, that is true. It, it, it generally has struggled to get the, uh, but it, there again, I mean, with all the stories in the press about maybe there's not going to be a, a, you know, HS2, is it going to be cancelled? I don't think that probably helps people think I'm going to dedicate my life mm. to, uh, or, you know, my ed education to going to, um, a, a college, which is dedicated to something that the press tell me might not happen. Um, I think we've put that to bed now and um, and actually the economic environment of the country has changed and will change more as we come out of, uh, of COVID and these are truly skilled jobs that we will be requiring that will pay good salaries for a long period of time into the future and have loads of transferable skills um, that come from it. So I would I would like to think um, that these would be much more exciting opportunities, even though they were exciting in the first place. So Neil Robertson, as you say, we haven't invested much in the North recently, so the local skills are not ready. We are building a plan to help ensure local people get these high value jobs and attract young people. It's called Roots into Rail. May we co-opt you co -opt on, your, on your support? I think there's a typo there. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I mean, I've actually heard of Roots into Rail, and um, I, I, in fact, I was being briefed on it by someone the other day. So yes, I'm. 
so I, I'm keen to get as many people on. So I mean, we need more drivers. You know, we, we need more engineers. We need more drivers. We need more people. To, we are we are going to be a growth market in the future. If you look at the plans for infrastructure alone, when it comes to rail infrastructure, we simply cannot get enough people into. Uh, um, well, we're barely getting enough people in to deliver what we've already got. We need more, and it's so. Um, and they are really exciting opportunities, and uh, so we. Yeah, I'm very keen to work with anybody that can help uh, on that. And I know Rutan Terrell has, has got a proper plan. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Chris. That leads quite nicely on to uh, Judith, um, uh, who can talk about our vision 2025. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chris. That's um, wonderful to hear because obviously the museum, everything we're about is about getting young people excited about the opportunities to work in uh, engineering in the railways. Um, and we have lots of exciting plans at the museum which will help things like Roots Interrail, um, uh, the National College and lots of other opportunities around apprentices as well. Um, I just thought it'd be worth uh, saying that, you know, for, for the museum, um, as we look forward to reopening the museum, um, it's quite exciting. There's a lot of exciting things happening at the moment. Listening to the announcements today of the, the spend in the north, um, it's obviously also very fantastic to hear Boris continually talking about putting York at the forefront of his plans for relocating Parliament. Um, and we welcome that with open arms. We're ready and waiting. Um, York Central is the area that's being discussed for, for government departments um, and or for uh, Parliament moving to. And it's exciting to see that after uh, decades of discussion around York Central, it is now happening. Um, York Central will become this thriving addition to York City uh, with new businesses, new homes, a remodelled uh, railway station. Back to you were talking earlier, Chris, about investment in stations. But also for us, it's a transformed uh, National Railway Museum. Um, we're, we're using this time um, to plan to be turning the Ra National Railway Museum into an engineering powerhouse. Um, we're using the past and the present, connect our visitors and, our, and young people and innovators with the future of the railways. Um, part of our redevelopment is to have a dedicated gallery which is about what's the challenges of, the, of rail into the future? What's the challenges that the country and the world face that the railways can help solve? Um, and we know that that's a way that we can get young people to see why is it relevant to them? Why is it something they want to be part of into the future? Um, we have a very clear mission, which is to inspire the engineers of tomorrow. Um, and we want to play a big part in uh, the future of the railways, taking the opportunity to showcase the great technological developments and inspiration that we have in this country. So we can inspire the next generation of engineers, innovators, uh, operators, managers, drivers, all of the, the areas we know that um, we desperately need people. Um, our Vision 2025 Master Plan is intrinsic in showing that the rail industry at its best, the rail industry today and into the future, and addressing, as I've said, the stem shortfall uh, that the country is currently facing. Um, I will say, of course, our museums are facing a huge financial challenge as a result of coronavirus. Um, but really, if the pandemic has taught us anything that we've been going through, it's that we must be more committed than ever to continuing our mission of inspiring the next, uh, next generation of science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, we, we really need to create the partnerships with organisations that are also passionate about science and engineering and who want to improve its understanding. Um, so it's vital for us that the people along today, the people in the rail industry, um, for us to work alongside them to solve uh, some of these issues of getting young people uh, to see that this is an opportunity for them. Um, I suppose what, what I'd just like to finish up with saying is, is a couple of things, which is um, uh, I think it's brilliant that the museum is part of and central to debates like this to, to think about the, the investment in rail, but particularly the rest, investment in the north. Um, obviously, where we are based is um, uh, a great pride to us, both the National Railway Museum in York, but also locomotion based in uh, County Durham. Um, 
in Shildon, which was the first railway town in the world. Um, you know, we're, we're very proud that we have a museum there. Um, and as I said, I just want to um, reach out to the rail industry to say that we want to work with you on how we can move these things forward. And as you would expect, our development team will be in contact with you to see how we can find ways of working together. So thank you for, your com for coming along today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, am I wrapping up, Julie, or is that back to you? No, nope? okay. <laughs> um, um, I'll just check there was no more questions came in. No, nothing else has come in. So um, I'd like to thank Chris for taking the time today to come along and talk to us. I know it's uh, very, very busy for you at the moment. So thank you for taking the time um, and to um, Dame Mary Archer, our chair, for um, uh, opening the session with us today. And thank you for uh, people from within the rail industry for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Chris. You can unmute.